G'day fellas and welcome to a tier list video. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at all the unique units available to you in Age of Empires 4. We've got every single one of them here. We've got military units, we've got religious units, we've got imperial officials, which are kind of like a villager unit, and we've also got the Khan that's in here as well. So all of the unique units are in here. Now, before we just get into it, I will state this being a tier list is subjective. That means that you may agree with it, you may disagree with it, and that's perfectly okay. If you'd like to make your own tier list, I'll leave a link in the description and in the pinned comments where you can find access to this as well. So without further ado, let's get into it. We're going to be starting off with the Holy Roman Empire. The... Do I dare say it? Do I dare say it? It's tempting to say. I'm not going to say it. We're going to put it in D tier, unfortunately. This unit here, Lunch Connect is a unit which is unfortunately not the best it's the the way the way that the current meta is currently set this unit doesn't really seem to have a place just simply because with spring and meta arms it doesn't really get a chance to go in it is a very weak unit it doesn't offer a lot to the team and realistically the resources are just better spent in other places so whether that be meta arms whether that be spring whether that be knights or lances it is almost always better spent in another place so look we, we may see that the meta begins to develop and change but at the moment uh with the way that things transition in the castle age it just doesn't seem like it is going to be a super duper strong unit uh now we're moving on to the prelate which is the unique uh monk unit for the holy roman empire and it is s tier that is correct it is s tier so they get one d tier and one s tier this unit is absolutely insane it is available to you in the first age it buffs up your units by 40%, which is so massive, or your villagers by 40%, uh, their gather speed. It's so, so huge. Uh, obviously, it's bugged at the moment, but even in spite of that, it is still incredibly strong. One of the big things that really attracts the Prelate to me is that because it's available in the first age, you can actually make more of them in the second age as well. And then by the time you hit the third age, you can actually have your Prelates out on the map, ready to pick up relics so that as soon as you hit age three, bam straight away pick those relics up and begin walking back to your regnitz cathedral so part of the reason why the prelate is so strong is because of the regnitz cathedral if the regnitz cathedral wasn't in the game prelate probably wouldn't be s tier probably be like b tier maybe a tier something like that but it definitely wouldn't be um it definitely wouldn't be s tier so that's why it is up there so next unit we've got is the mangadai mangadai is going to sit in c tier not particularly strong unit it's a good it's a great raiding unit but i think that this unit is quite underwhelming uh, definitely when it comes up to he comes uh, down to heads up combat so that means like a man fight where you're fighting against someone you know close to, close to close or you know shot for shot uh the mangadai is not going to perform a very expensive unit um ideally you want to just have about you know five to eight of these guys and just raiding constantly but even then it's very easy to mitigate these just with a couple of outposts they're very easy to stop and so that's why they it sits in the C tier, because even though it is a difficult to balance unit, and especially in team games, it can be strong. And I'm confident there's going to be a lot of people who have been playing uh, against the Mongols in team games, and you've just had so much trouble with these units. But when it comes to more competitive 1v1 environments, I think they can be nullified very easily through a couple of outposts, and especially through walls as well. Now, the next unit is the Khan. The Khan is going to be an S tier unit as well. Obviously, for anybody unfamiliar with the Khan, an impressive unit in the early game, able to annoy villagers, force you to go idle off your gold mine. Uh, once it gets up to the second age, it starts to be able to actually kill them. It means that when you're in the early game, that you're never really going to be able to take a dock against this guy because he's always going to be able to catch up to you, find you, hunt you down, that sort of thing. Obviously, he's got buffs in there, and of course, he's free. He respawns every two minutes. He's incredibly powerful and still one of the strongest reasons why the Mongols are so damn good at the moment. So he sits up in the ST at the moment. Next up is the Rus. So the Rus, we've got the Warrior Monk, who I'm going to be putting in the A tier here. Uh, similarly for the Prelate, uh, the Warrior Monk, typically with the Rus, the build order that they're doing at the moment is professional scouts into Fast Castle with the Abbey of the Trinity, and then going up and getting out a whole bunch of these guys. And this is really strong. So... The reason why these guys are, are super duper strong and I put them in A tier, first and foremost, they can defend themselves against wolves. So prelates can't do that. Scholars can't do that. Where are the scholars down here? Scholars can't do that. You know, any of the other monks are unable to do that. It is only these guys that can do that. Then, of course, they're also 1.62 movement speed as well. So they're as fast as a lancer. So they're super duper fast, enable you to get out onto the map, get those relics before your enemy can. 
which is a really important thing. And then they've also got other buffs as well. In inspirational buffs, so they can buff up armor by one uh, when they get a tap in. They can also get a couple of other buffs as well. Uh, they're just a very, very strong unit, and Abbey of the Trinity contributes to that because it reduces the cost of those guys down by half. Uh, next Rus unit is going to be the Horse Archer. That's actually going to be an S tier unit. So the cost of this unit is what makes it so incredibly strong. 80 food, 40 wood, very, very cheap, a very high DPS unit. Also has an incredibly long range, so 4.5 range with an upgrade to 6.5 in Imperial. So if you can get to Imperial with the Rus, these Horse Archers absolutely go ham. But one thing to note is they don't trade that cost effectively. Uh, so if you have got, you know, Knights are, are quite effective against them. Uh, Springwoods are quite effective against them. But the issue is once you start getting up to that, you know, that number of around 60, 70 of these guys, there's, there's not a lot that can stop them. Like you're going to have to switch into Mangonels. And obviously if you're playing against the Rus, they deal with Siege very easily with their, um, with their own Springwoods. So it's going to be very, very tough. Uh, next unit up is the Streltsy. The Streltsy is going to be sitting in B tier, our first B tier of the game. So this unit is one of those units. It's actually a very, very strong unit in my opinion. But just with the way that Siege meta currently uh, sits, it doesn't. It's not actually that strong because it's very easily countered by Ma uh, by Mangadels, uh, and that's primarily it. Uh, it also gets countered pretty effectively by um, enemy Springles as well. And so that's really why it just sits there at the moment. Uh, I, do, I do suspect once the Springwood gets nerfed, we're probably going to see it rise back up to S tier. Uh, I, I initially had the Streltsy up in, in S tier, you know, uh, quite early on in this patch. But at the moment, it is sitting at the moment in B. Uh, next up is the Abbasid. So we've got the Abbasid Camel Archer. So that sits in the A tier. This is a really strong unit throughout the early game, mid game, and even in the late game. It's a bit buggy at the moment. So for anybody unfamiliar, don't get the Flaming Arrows upgrade. It... It, it's it's bad for the it, it actually negatively affects the camels they lose damage um but the, the camels are still incredibly strong even into the late game um with that bug uh in in the early game they've got a lot of great upgrades so like with the military wing as an example they get the plus one armor so from camel support they also get things like plus 25 um from the i think it's the composite bow upgrade uh there's there's also uh camel armor that they get there's so many good upgrades for them they, they're really really strong units and most importantly, they're really easy to make and macro for. They're great on hybrid maps. Uh, 100 and, 180 food? 60 wood? Is that right? I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, which is wild. It's like such a great ratio. Like you really want to be investing in, in food units because they're just so easy to get. Uh, so it's a, a really, really strong unit throughout the game. And uh, of course, it's got that camel aura, uh, which counters cavalry quite effectively. Also very good against Springholds as well. Uh, so that's one thing to note. Uh, next Abbasid unit is the Camel Rider. Going to be sitting in the D tier. This unit at the moment, very, very weak. Uh, if you make this unit, you will just lose. It is just simply better to make Knights. Uh, and if you're thinking, yeah, but they, they do really well against um, against Knights themselves. Yeah, they do, but they're just nowhere near as... Uh, they, they don't have the utility uh, that Knights have got. Knights can raid. These guys can't raid. Knights can kill anything. These guys can't. They can only kill cavalry. Uh, and that really, really hurts them. So, look, I think if you want to mix in one or two, don't even mix in these guys. Mix in your camel archers, and it's going to be a lot easier. If, if you want to go cavalry, go go uh, knights or lancers, and then go with some uh, some uh, camel archers behind it. It's going to be a lot easier. All right, so next unit up, we've got the French. French have got a lot of unique units, so we're going to be starting with the Arbolatria. Uh, it is going to be going into the B tier. Now, you might be thinking with all of the upgrades that the Arbolatria has got that it is an absolutely insane unit, and I would agree with you. With regard to crossbows, it's incredibly good. It's got plus five armor, uh, both ranged and melee. It's got the uh, the Pavis, which it can, uh, you know, buff that up. It's got Gambesons for the uh, increased uh, rate of fire or, or the rather the reduced reload speed. So it's got all these awesome upgrades. But the issue is not actually that. The issue is the crossbow, which is a good unit, but it just doesn't really have a spot in the meta at the moment. Um, obviously, like armored units are really strong. But because of the way Siege works and how effective it is against these sort of uh, range units, it just it hasn't found a place yet. So it's unfortunate, but that's just the way that it is. So it sits in C tier. Next unit up is the Royal Knight uh, for the French. So it's going to be going in S tier as well. Seems like we've got a lot of S tier units uh, at the moment. I suspect that will probably get balanced out as we go on. Uh, so the Royal Knight, why is it strong? It's strong because you can get it in H2. It's strong because it can heal. It's strong because it can heal in H2. So what do you do? You go in. 
under your enemy's town center or outpost or wherever it is, you do two hits, so you charge, and then you, you do one melee attack and you kill a villager, and then you run away. And then you heal up that HP that was missing, and that is why they're so damn good. And then obviously in the late game, they also get royal bloodlines rather than biology, which is a unique upgrade for the French and they have the best knights in the game. So very comfortably throughout the early game, the mid game, and the late game, this is the best knight there is by far. Obviously, they've also got the extra damage that comes in after the charge, uh, which I think is 13 damage for three seconds, which works out to be two hits. So very, very nice as well. But, uh, you know, it's it, that, that's just the cherry on top. Next unit up is the, the cannon, which is the unique bombard unit. Uh, for the French. So this is going to go into the B tier. Uh, nothing really special about this, to be honest. Like, the fact that it can pack up and, and set down without, you know, needing to, to actually take that time, it's not a huge difference, to be honest. Like, when it comes to sort of late-game battles, like, you don't you don't really notice it. Like, wh whether you've got bombards or cannons, I don't think anybody's going to be, like, batting an eyelid uh, at, at the difference between the two. It would be like... If, if you had a unique archer and then it was like a unique archer that was like a tiny little bit faster like just, just a smidgen it's like it's, it doesn't even it, it doesn't even come close to like being a a quote-unquote uh viable not a viable but like a a good um a a good uh cannon or bombard replacement uh so next up is the gallius gallius is a little bit i, I suspect this is probably going to divide people i don't like the gallius i think it's too slow i also think it takes up too much population um, and people will say, okay, but you can use it in H3, it's a cannon ship, it's got AoE. Yep, I, I agree with you, but it's expensive, it's slow, it can get easily picked off. If you ever get outnumbered on the water, you will lose all of your bombards. They can't, um, they can't kite at all, so you always need to maintain the advantage, and if you ever lose the advantage, you lose all of them. They're very susceptible as well to, um, any sort of flanks from, uh, fl uh flame ships or, or destructo ships, what do you call them? Uh... I can't even remember what they're calling. I'm just going to call them C4 ships, terrorist ships. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Pirate ships. Yeah, we'll call them pirate ships. Um, the junks. What are they called? Oh, I can't even remember now. I've gone, I've gone absolutely crazy. I'm going to have to go check. Give me a second. Learn English. Doc. Demolition ship. Geez, Strongo, how'd you do that? Gosh, tell you what. This guy. All right, let's move into the Chinese uh, so first up is the nest of bees, and you guys will de be definitely not surprised to see the nest of bees sitting solidly in the DTR. It is completely useless. Do not build this unit. It is absolutely terrible at the moment. Uh, the mangonel is a very good unit. The um, the nest of bees is not. The nest of bees actually begins to outdo the, the mangonel at about, I, I would say about five or six. So if you had five mangonels, you know, you could... I, I would say that five nest of bees would be about the same as that. Once you start getting a bit higher than that, then the nest of bees definitely becomes really good. So the, the main issue is that the damage, uh, the way that the damage gets issued with the nest of bees versus the mangonel. The mangonel, it's like this. It's like a clap. It just goes, you know, they launch their rockets and or they launch their stones and it's bang, damage. The problem with the nest of bees, it's do, 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 do. It's very slow. And so there's no impact from it, and it's very easy to dodge. It's very easy to get away from. You, you can pull your units back. There's no punishment from it. If you have two or three nest of bees and fire into your enemy, they're going to be able to get away with not a single unit of them dying versus a mangonel, and you would have killed 20 units in a single blob. And so that's why it sits in DTR. Don't make this unit. Uh, next up, we've got the Imperial Official. Uh, this probably might be another one that divides people. People might be thinking it's DTR just because it's got so many bugs, and I'd be pretty close to agreeing with you, but... We're actually going to put it in A tier. I think this unit is incredibly strong. And one of the reasons why is the supervision ability. In fact, that's the only reason why. So tax, the way that the tax system works at the moment, I don't think it needs to be overhauled. I just need, I think that they need to get the bugs fixed with it. And I think they need to do some like changes to the core mechanics of it to actually make it function a lot less easily without the micromanagement. Because I don't know about you guys, but you like using Imperial officials in the early game, it's so hard, man. My APM is sitting at like 300 trying to scout, trying to use this. And I'm a minute into the game and I'm sitting on 300 APM, like trying to micro an Imperial official between a lumber camp and a mill, trying to collect gold at the same time, make sure my villagers don't miss a drop at the same. It's crazy, but it's incredibly strong. Um, and part of the reason why is because you can get this bad boy on things like the astronomical clock tower, which gives your siege much higher HP. 
and then you can buff that up. You can make it train at three times the speed that it normally would. And that's what makes them so strong. And you can do that with other buildings as well. Like, let's say you're in the early game, you spot your enemies pushing out. So what do you do? You drop down an archery range really quickly. You get your Imperial official on it straight away and you just start making archers. It makes it like you've got three archery ranges there. So you don't have to drop down three archery ranges. You just drop down one. You get your Imperial official over there supervising. Bam. There you go. Uh, in addition to that, it can also uh, help out a lot with your resources. So let's say you're on a pretty resource type map. Let's say you really need stone. What, what do you do? You get all your villagers over there gathering stone and you get your Imperial official to supervise that... Um, that mining camp, that's going to take your stone that you've gathered. Let's say you gather a thousand stone and it's going to multiply that by 1.2. So now you have 1200 stone. It gives you resources out of thin air and it can do this all game. It's an incredibly strong unit. Uh, but the, one of the things, or one of the big issues is, is limited. You can only make four of them at the moment. I think that that should probably change. Probably, I think the way that it should change is make it so that you can make an extra one each age that you go up. So maybe make it three in age one, four in age two, five in age three, and then six in age four. I think that's probably going to be the best way to do it because four at the moment doesn't seem like enough in the late game. I've got buildings that are sitting there with like 900 tacks. Anyway, next unit, let's move on. And it is the Palace Guard. Another one that might be a bit de decisive. I just put it in the B tier. So in smack bang in the middle. Um, so it's, it's missing an armor but it's slightly faster and that it, it can be good and it can be bad. Um, and I, I'm kind of leaning a bit more towards putting this in the A tier than I am towards the uh, keeping it in the B tier, but we'll, we'll keep it here for now. So for anybody uh, aware of how like the current meta is, it's men at arms plus spring hoods. That that's essentially it. Uh, so palace guards are actually quite good because they can outrun enemy men at arms and they can also, and then they can begin to run down the spring hoods. But the issue is they are, at their core weaker than men at arms because they have one less armor so they're constantly taking one more damage and your opponent is taking one less damage all the time uh and so I, th they're a men at arm replacement they're slightly faster look i overall i think you know i, I would rather have them than have the men at arms but I, at the same time it can be very difficult taking on the men at arms so that's why they sit uh, in the b tier because there's no real distinct uh advantage to having them all right so we move on to the next unit it's the chugunu uh now this has got a lot of different pronunciations uh, I think at the moment in the game, it's uh, uh but in Age of Empires 3, they'll call the Chukunu, and that's what I'm going to be sticking with. Um, and so this unit is a unit that I think is getting a little bit more play recently, but at the moment, it's just seems, it, it seems really expensive. It's 120 resources. It's 60 food, 30 wood, 30 gold. Now that can be reduced by the Spirit Way landmark, but it's actually bugged. It doesn't reduce the wood cost. It only reduces the gold and the food cost. Um, so th it, it is, uh, it's, it's a unit, I think in the, in the, um, second age and in, in the, uh, feudal age, it's actually quite a strong unit. If you can get to it, if you can get a nice mass up and as long as your enemy doesn't get to age three ahead of you, because as soon as they get men at arms, as soon as they get knights, there's just no point in making it, uh, in the late game, they can get a lot of damage out. So they can get up to 11 damage per bolt and they do fire three bolts, which isn't terrible. Um, but keep in mind, they are expensive. That that's the, the big drawback for these bad boys is they are very expensive and you've obviously got to go into that Song Dynasty to get them. So speaking of dynasties, the next one up is going to be... Uh, we'll do the Fire Lancer because it, it is the next dynasty unit. Uh, so I'm going to be sticking this in the B tier. And that's like with a little bit of a caveat, similarly to the um, to the Chogunu here. And that's that I think this unit is actually going to become pretty powerful in the meta in the next two weeks. Um, just because of the way the Springwood meta is evolving. And one of the, I, I've been wanting to make a video on this, but you know, just documenting how the meta has evolved over the past... Or, or, over the first month and how we're going to look on, at it because at the moment it, the, the meta is springles mass springles and fire lances are actually incredibly good against that so they get bonus damage against buildings they get bonus damage against siege uh, and more so than any other unit uh, they're also quite cheap as well when you build them around the spirit way they get um, significantly reduced costs um, and the the big thing though is that it is expensive to invest into them so you have to build both of your age three landmarks. So that's a total of 2,400 food, a total of 2,000 gold just to unlock this unit. Uh, so uh, at the moment, it sits in a B tier, I think primarily because it's underused. But I suspect once it starts getting a bit more play, we're going to see people building this bad boy and getting it out on the map and it's going to start wreaking havoc. I really do think so. Uh, in incredibly cool unit. All right, let's talk about the Grenadier. If you ever wanted a win condition as the Chinese, it is the Grenadier. You if you get to this unit, it's pretty much good game. It is so expensive to invest into this. Uh, 2,400 food times two, because uh, you need to make two of those landmarks. And then what is it? 1,600 gold for each one, I think. I'm not sure 100%, but um, it's a lot. 
just to in just to get access to this unit it is incredibly expensive you need to hit your final dynasty for it but if you can these things are like baby mangonels and they're so freaking good uh the only reason they're not sitting in st at the moment is just because obviously they don't have the same impact on the game that units like these do uh they, they still are very very strong in my opinion uh, and if you can get to them, you will probably win the game. I think I've only ever lost one game where I, I actually unlocked the Grenadier. I still remember it now. It was on Mountain Pass. Uh, not on Mountain Pass. It was on uh, French Pass, and I was playing against a Rus player. Um, and my, my base got raided to hell, and I had no economy. I tried to migrate my economy. It didn't work. Uh, I think it was against Tarto, actually. It was it was very good. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he uh, it, the, the Grenadier is just one of those units. It's incredibly effective against archers, against siege, against buildings, against cavalry charges, literally against everything except for horsemen. Horsemen are the only things uh, that, that counter it very effectively. So just watch out for those horsemen. That is really it. All right. And then finally, we're going to be moving into the English now. The English, the Longbowman. I'm sure you guys already see where it's coming. It is indeed the S tier. This guy is a little bit more expensive. He's a little bit slower than your standard archer. But I tell you what, he makes up for it with his range, his extra plus one damage. It makes him so strong. Even in a matchup where I thought that he would be having a difficult time going up against the French, it actually turns his weakness into a strength. Uh, because by having so the longbow gets one extra damage um, compared to a normal archer it also gets an extra two range which that longbow damage can then be converted into more hp off the knight off the royal knight so it means in the early game the longbow does very effectively against the royal knight so that's something to really be uh considering or be aware of um, but other than that look the, the unit's incredibly good it's got its palings ability it's got its uh, healing circle ability or the fire camp ability. And then finally, it's got um, the uh, attack speed ability as well in age four. Then on top of that, it's got network of castles, a network of citadels upgrade as well. It's got it, like there's just so much synergy that's going on with the English in general uh, that makes the longbow really, really such a great unit. But um, it j just even by itself, it's still just an STR. If you're ever playing a team game, you want an English player on your team, you want to make sure that you've got those longbows out because they are very, very potent. All right, now we move on to the Delhi. Okay, so we're going to start with their Tower War Elephant. We'll be putting it in the C tier. This unit, now a lot of people might be looking at that and going, okay, come on, it's Delhi, man. That should, that's an S tier unit. It's a big boy. It's an elephant. Yeah, I hear you. But you, uh, all of this is with the caveat that it is in the current meta. There will be a day that an elephant will be in S tier, but it's not today. And the reason why is because the Springled is too potent. And you guys know that the Springled is going to be able to so easily snipe out these bad boys. It's going to be able to snipe it and run away. It's faster than the elephant. So it's like, it's one of those things. Even though I love this unit, I don't think it's going to be any higher than the B tier. It is, you know, if you do get a lot of these guys out, they can definitely trash your enemy's army if they're not prepared, if they're not ready for it. If they if they are just sort of sitting there and you just bring in four or five of these bad boys, they are going to clean house. But the problem is if your opponent gets time to respond to it, they get crossbows out, they get their springwoods out, they get, you know, some spears out on the front line as well. It is not going to last very long. So let's move on to the next unit, the War Elephant. And I'd love to say the same thing about the War Elephant, but unfortunately... It sits in the C tier. I love the Delhi, but unfortunately, uh, the War Elephant goes in the D tier, in the C tier rather, uh, just because of its strength. It is, it's very good in some matchups, in night heavy matchups. So against like the French, it's very good. If the French, like if I'm playing against the French player as the Delhi, I'm very happy because I know that he's going to be making knights and I'm just going to make War Elephants in response and I'm going to have a great time because he's not going to be able to kill my War Elephants. I'm going to have my uh, scholars behind him and they're going to be absolutely fine. But in every other matchup where, you know, knights are less common, um, then, you know, pretty much the war elephant is just going to get picked off the same way that the tower war elephant is as well. And finally, our last unit for the tier list, it is the scholar and it is going to be going in the A tier. I love this unit. I think it's incredibly strong. Uh, it's got a lot of cool, unique upgrades that the Delhi have got access to. Most importantly, though, the uh, Dome of the Faith reduces the cost of the scholar down, uh, brings it down to... Uh, 75 gold, which is wonderful. Uh, very, very cheap. Basically, you can capture a sacred site with it. And if, if it dies, that's okay. You still make your gold back no matter what. Um, and then on top of that, so the, the Scholar has just got some amazing upgrades for the Delhi. Um, and while we're, that's probably, you know, going outside a little bit, you know, because we're not necessarily looking at those sort of unique upgrades. Rather, we're looking at the, the Scholar. But I, I think it would be dangerous not to look at that. Um you know, because it's so important. So just like being, you know, having sanctity access to, to, um, 
the uh, sacred sites in age one and in age two a really really strong bonus as well uh and so that's why it sits in the atl well fellas that is the tier list uh i don't know whether you'll agree with it but uh, i hope that you've enjoyed the video and enjoyed my insight into it if you have uh, agreed with it i encourage you to leave a like if you have disagreed with it i encourage you leave a comment let me know what you would have done differently and most importantly if you want to make your own tier list there'll be a link in the description and as well as in the pinned comment and i'll catch you guys in the next video thank you for watching